Greetings, folks. This is Enrico Nardini with Play Unplugged at Play Unplugged TV, and we're here at Origins 2012, and I'm here with Catalyst Games' Randall Bills. Uh, Randall Bills, please say hi to the audience. Hello, audience. Randall, could you tell me before we get started a little bit about what your job is at Catalyst Games? Uh, I'm the managing developer for Catalyst Game Labs, which pretty much means that uh, any type of game that comes in and then ends up going out, I touch it in some fashion. Uh, I have line developers under me, so for example for Battletech and Shadowrun, which are really big lines, I don't directly interact with them, but I work directly with the line developers to ensure that schedules are met, uh, if they need some help with a particular, you know, developing a particular type of product. Uh, you know, it's my job to try to keep the schedules going. Uh, and make sure that the products are coming out when we say we want them to come out and at a quality that we want them as well. Both very good things and very important things for uh, for any game company, absolutely. So, Origins 2012, I see a lot of signs for Leviathan. Um, can you tell me a little bit about it? Uh, Leviathans is a game we've had in development for <laughs> uh, quite a while now. For anyone who's been following it up on uh, MonstersInTheSky.com, um, there's a whole legacy um, of trials and tribulations, but uh, the basic concept is that it's an alternate uh, history kind of steampunk style miniatures game where in the late 1800s a Polish scientist isolates this fluid and you pass electrical current through it and it generates a levitating force. And this is right as you're then heading into Thomas Edison and Nikolai Tesla. Humanity's ability to generate electricity is uh, increasing exponentially. Uh, and so by the time of 1910, which is when it's set, the wet navies of the world have become air navies of the world. Uh, and one of the great things about it is that there, there's uh, quite a few different steampunk-esque games out there. And usually when they talk about airships, they're usually saying dirigibles or zeppelins, whereas these are, you know, 5, 10, 15,000 ton steel vessels flying through the air, you know, trying to blow the crap out of each other. So that's kind of the universe concept. And then the game, it comes in a big box game. Uh, you take the lid off and the miniatures are pre-painted, pre-assembled, so you can pull them right out and start playing. They're wonderful visuals. And then the play is all color-coded and dice-coded. So they're... There's very few modifiers in the game. Like a lot of tabletop miniatures games, there's a whole table full of modifiers. Yeah, know? most of them have like, you know, you, you really do need a, like a quick reference sheet, a big quick reference sheet that has all the different things going on. Exactly. And, and one of the things, when I originally, originally was designing the game, I had that. Uh, and the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, you know, I want to provide an easier barrier of entry somehow. And somewhere along the way, and to be honest, at this point, because it's been so long, I can't remember what the epiphany moment was. But somewhere along the way, I realized that the combination of bell curves of polyhedral dice can mimic all the different modifiers of target movement, your movement, and range. And so the dice, the colored dice, even though they're D12s in shape, they're all basically polyhedrals. And so you're looking at your ship card, you're grabbing the colored dice, you're looking at there, you're grabbing the dice, you're throwing them together, adding them up, and then comparing in the breach number, did I get it or did I not get it? So it's, it's much quicker, it's smoother, uh, yet all of the tactics that make a tactical board game interesting are still all there. So we're, and, and here at the show, it's finally out. We finally, we got in, couple of dozen copies and they sold out in about you know 55 minutes so it's it's been fantastic to finally have this thing game out that's awesome and, and it's great I think when you when you have trials and tribulations you know to finally come through and have it delivered it must have been a real not only a relief but a kind of an exultation um, what were some of the like what were what did, you, what did you find like maybe just talk about one or two like what were the difficult things about getting it uh, about what, what what held it up what, what made it difficult to get it out uh, ultimately, it was a case of Leviathans turned into a product that, you know, Catalyst is still growing. You know, we're only four years old and we're, we're finding our niche. And while we love Battletech and Shadowrun, and we will, as long as somebody lets us, we'll be involved and in loving those franchises until the day we die. Um, but we're also trying to expand and, you know, we have some new board games out at the show. We're starting to do some other RPGs, but Leviathans is... We just went so over the top. We had such giant aspirations for the size of the box and what we wanted to put in and the quality of the miniatures that it almost was too big for us as a company. Um, and then we ran into issues of uh, foreign manufacturing, the miniatures, and like last Gen Con, it was supposed to be out at last Gen Con, after not coming out the Gen Con before, 
and we almost ran into a situation where multiple company, foreign companies were almost holding it hostage because they were fighting, and it was just this whole long series of just unbelievable situations that I never imagined uh, could possibly happen. But uh, so yeah, we're it's finally out, and in fact, you know, you guys can't see it, but right over there, like four or five tables of guys, you know, playing. I was last night up until about 2 a.m. playing a giant. Uh, 20 people on a side playing a game, so it's it's great to have it out and have people loving it. So. Yeah, frankly, the components just look wonderful. It looks really nice. Um, so I had a couple of uh, we, you know, this was an interview that a, a lot of the Plan Plug fans actually were really they were really pushing for, and so um, one thing that I wanted to ask about was Shadowrun Anniversary Edition. Uh, tell me a little bit about it. Well, the Shadowrun Anniversary Edition is. I guess like, uh, you know, pimping out 4th edition, if you will. So 4th edition came out a number of years ago. And one of the problems with Shadowrun for most people, not everyone, but for most people is they've always, it was the game that you played despite the rules. So that the universe was instantly a hit. It sinks your teeth into you and it will never let go. But the rules through three different iterations just really were hard for a lot of people to get into. But you played it anyways because you love the rules so much. It's so funny you said that because that's actually was always my struggle with the first. With especially, uh, we played a lot of second edition when I was a kid. I started gaming, um, you know, when I was around like 12 years old. And second edition Shadow Run was pretty big, and um, the. You know, like I, 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 we enjoyed the the world, but doing things like decking was really hard. Yeah. Magic, like, kind of worked within the system, but there were also complications there too. But man, I remember it felt like you know whoever understood the decking rules the best <laughs> could GM the game, yeah. and then pretty much everybody <laughs> tried to play around it. And a yeah. lot of times the decking was so separate because it was like everybody's playing this game, and then the deckers over here playing a totally different game. Yeah, exactly. And it, in fact, it. I think it's a testament to the strength of the universe that if it had been almost any other game or if the universe hadn't have been so cool, I'm not sure it could have survived those first edition rules because they were awful. Yeah, and the, but the great thing is, and you know, like, I, this is one of those things, like one of my friends, so I, you know, like, it was weird, one of my friends pulled, like, we, when Shadowrun 4th edition came out, one of my friends was very pumped um, and he wanted to run it and it was kind of like, oh, I don't know. Well, we played it, I, I'll tell you, the rules have improved dramatically. It's a really fun game. Well, and that's what the fourth, that's what fourth edition did, is the previous the second and third edition really tried to stay true to the original edition, but we're putting patches on. And ultimately, the thought process was that you just, you couldn't patch it. You know, there were, there was a time where you needed to get in there and just really start slicing things away, make the rules more streamlined. And so fourth edition was about doing that, making it more streamlined, more easy to play, making it so that decking um, could be done in a much simpler, easier fashion, that the that those deckers were running with the runners, that suddenly you didn't have to stop and go off here for 20 minutes and resolve that aspect. So then when we did the anniversary edition, one is we went in and did it in full color, which Shadowrun's never had a full color rulebook before. Um, and then it was also there were some nips and tucks, but it also was more about just a representation, uh, making the book easier to use. Um, we put fiction, lots and lots of fiction. I think there's 30 some thousand words of fiction in it. Uh, and then the other thing that we're most excited about is because we actually had a situation where fourth edition came out and then the five core rule books that expand on that came out afterwards. And then the anniversary edition came out, we were able to go through and create a master index so that the Shadowrun 4th uh, anniversary edition, excuse me, has an index in it that covers all of the five previous rule books, which was something that I've never really seen before. So that was something that, that was great that we could do. That's really cool. Now, one thing, you know, we, you talked a lot about like the, the the kind of pervasiveness of the Shadowrun world and like the the what uh, what gamers refer to as the fluff the uh, the story of the uh -huh. world. Um, recently, you guys released some books that were almost entirely or were entirely like background material. How, how like that's that's kind of almost unheard of in the industry, uh, with the exception of like novels and novellas and things like that. How did that work for you guys? Like, is that something is that something that you would consider doing again? Uh, we might consider doing again. Uh, you're probably referring to in specifically the Six World Almanac, which was there wasn't a single rule in the whole book, yeah. uh, and it absolutely was an experiment. And one of the things that Catalyst tries not to be afraid of, and you know, sometimes we've got bit for it, is to not be afraid, you know. So we haven't done a world book ever, uh, you know, let's give that a try. Let's see if the fans might like that. 
Um, it hasn't always worked out for us, um, but that's generally not going to stop us because usually, you know, out of the the eight or nine times we try, you know, over half the time it has been a success. So that means, you know, we're going to continue going to continue to keep looking at that. Yeah, and that's a good average. Um, so one of our freelance writers had a question also. Uh, freelance writer Scott Powell wanted to know, he's a big lover of uh, Battletech, but he really likes Quick Strike because you can play, play a lot of mechs quickly. Is there any plans on taking that and taking it to like, a, to making that a, like a book in and of itself, a different way to kind of play with the mechs? Uh, well, just to cover for those that might not uh, know what Quick Strike is, so um, Battletech has a set of rules that are buried in like the fifth core, fourth core rulebook called Quick Strike. That is an amalgam kind of a tabletop miniature play with a much faster style of Battletech play. So normally, if you're playing a company on company in Battletech, you know it's easily three to five hours, depending upon what you have, that the competency of the players involved. You can play the exact same thing in Quick Strike in easily under an hour. Uh, and so the last time I played a quick strike, we did it like a battalion on battalion, which is, you know, 36 plus units on a side. And we finished most of it up in a long afternoon. Um, currently, we don't have plans to take that out uh, and make it its own book, but we have been getting more and more comments along those lines. Uh, and we do take very seriously what our fans say. Uh, we're always looking at that. and. You know, down the line, we might do something, you know, similar to that. And I'd like to point out that it's not that you know, um, playing a five-hour game if you're into it is not a problem. And that kind of granularity, this simulationist aspect, I think is one of the appeals. But it would be cool to have both. I think. Well, w one of the things I'm most proud of of the core rulebook line that that we've produced over the last many years is that it's all been plug and play. In other words, in the past, and you know, I was even involved in those old past rule books, you know, often it was you had to know too much. You know, you, you'd want to put one type of rule in, say, for maximum tech, and it would require a supporting set of rules to make it happen. And so one of the reasons why the core line of rule books, if you go into your store and see them, and they're really freaking huge, and part of that is because we try to make all of the rules as encapsulated as possible. And so for the player that just wants to go down a little bit in, he can. For the player that wants to go only down this one thread, he can. Or the player that wants the entire kitchen sink and the, the aircraft carrier and the spaceship and everything under the sun. Or, or as I used to say, you know, if you want to have a mech fighting on in the side of a carrier that's sinking in water while a dropship's crashing down on top of it and volcanoes are going off in the background, you can do it all. It's all there. You know, we've got a rule for that. Uh, but it just means that you get to decide as the fan how far you want to go. And Quick Strike was absolutely about that, trying to create, okay, well, here's another path that players can go down to if they wish. What an awesome philosophy. So there are some other uh, new releases that are coming out for Catalyst Games. You want to talk about some of those? Uh, yeah, actually, first I want to talk about Cosmic Patrol, which has actually been out for a little under a year now. Um, it's an improv style, definitely uh, along the indie publishing line. It's a digest-sized book. A golden century sci-fi um, feeling of, of Buck Rogers and ray guns, and again, it's it's an improv style, so it's a GMless situation where it's fast and furious. Every one of your dossiers, which are kind of like your character sheets, uh, has a whole series of cues, which are like kind of like taglines. Uh, and they help you not only set yourself in the character, but when it comes your turn to improv, if you're kind of stumbling a little bit or you're unsure what to do, you can quickly look down and grab one of those lines, say it, and hopefully that then starts the words flowing and it, you know, it helps smooth out. And it's uh, those who have found it, it's kind of hard to find. It's a little red book. It's kind of lost in amongst the you know, unbelievable amount of other printed product that we have. Uh, but it's wonderfully fun and it's, it's a great break that you can take. It, you know, it likely will never be the giant campaign for the vast majority of people. But in between, you know, I'm taking a break from role-playing game X campaign, and before I start Y campaign up, hey, let's take a couple of sessions of Cosmic Patrol. Oh,